Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for staying here for this last and final session. Um, this, session is, this session is entitled, Who Leads? Putting Local Communities at the Heart of Your Programs. And I think for me, community is at the very heart of all of your bids. It's, it's the one word that has reoccurred from the beginning of the day and throughout the day by our speakers and our panelists. I'm uh, very excited to be joined by five incredibly talented and experienced people, all of whom I've met today for the first time. I'll just give you a very short uh, uh, description of who they are. Louise Jeffries is the Director of Arts at the Barbican. In this role, she leads on the formulation, implementation and delivery of the Barbican's artistic programme, marketing and comms operation and strategic vision. Emily G has served as Historic England's London Planning Director since October 2016. Emily has worked at Historic England since 2001 and was head of listing, listing advice from 2011 to 2016. Rosie Aikenhead. Rosie Aikenhead is the Senior Manager Audience Engagement at Time Out. In this role, Rosie leads on both global community strategy and implementation. She has set up a brand new community called Time Out Tastemakers, which now operates in seven cities around the world. Juan Lopez Aranguren Blasquez. <laughs> yeah. Juan. <laughs> is it long enough? <laughs> good, yeah. I'm grown up now. Juan is an architect and civic designer based in Madrid. He is co-founder of the artist and architecture collective Basurama. He is now coordinating the program Imagina Madrid for the Madrid City Council. And lastly, just at the end, Robin Simpson. Since September 2005, Robin has been chief executive of Voluntary Arts. Voluntary Arts provides information and advice services, undertakes lobbying and advocacy work, and delivers and supports projects to develop participation in creative cultural activities. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our panel. Please, a round of applause for them. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I just wanted to give uh, a sort of background to where, how we approach this particular session. Um, it's the importance of keeping local residents, communities, artists and arts organisations at the heart of the bid process. This might be to seek ideas and inspiration, co-creation of projects, discussions to see where and how step change might best be achieved in terms of authority and local community collaboration. Now does the bid, does, do your bid seek to engage with everyone in a variety of ways? From those who are already engaged with the arts in its multiple forms, to the third of Londoners who would answer no to the question whether they get involved in culture? Does it attempt to reach behind closed doors and involve those who are traditionally harder to reach, such as the elderly, the disabled, socially or economically challenged, the sick, the mentally or physically, <clears throat> the non-English speakers, those in the care or in the prison system? Every single borough has a story to tell and a wide range of people to tell it. Now, how do we find those stories and how do we tell those stories? I'd like the next half an hour, 40 minutes, to be hopefully a conversation. I appreciate um, the real conversations take place in the tea breaks and in the coffee breaks. But please do feel, if you do have a burning question, uh, or something to say, wave, put your hand up, and we'll, I'll try and keep an eye out for you. I grew up in a, on a few bends in the river, just that way. Uh, my parents uh, worked uh, in factories. Uh, my grandfather had a shop. We grew up in a fairly, what was often described as a sort of working class environment. And met, like, like some of you here today and, and, and others, I, I often have to remind myself that the people that I grew up with 
didn't get on the train from Erith or from Belvedere and come into Charing Cross and hang out. And I, I, I did, I, somehow something struck me that I could do that, but many people didn't. So what I'm interested in, in, in my role as a cultural ambassador is community. What does community mean? What does it mean to each of us? So that's the elephant in the room. I'll, I'll, I'll put that question out, first of all, to um, Louise. Um, Louise, what does community mean to you? Well, I took a rather pedestrian approach to this and looked up the, the meaning of the word community. <laughs> and actually, I thought it was really quite interesting. So there are two definitions. Um, a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common or a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. And I think it's really important that it's about the people, but it's also about a feeling. And I think inherent in those two definitions as well is the possibility, through some initiatives such as this, to create new communities, new senses of commonness, new senses of people coming together. And I also then, because one of the examples I'll probably talk about later is the Walthamstow Garden Party, which is a project we're involved with, looked up the, the word festival. And that's an event ordinarily celebrated by a community and centering on some characteristic aspects of that community and its religion or traditions. And I thought there was a really nice connection between those definitions of community and the notion of festival. Lovely, thank you. Can I, can I put that question to... Can I, can I come in on that? Um, uh, Louise is impressive doing her homework. <laughs> <laughs> I've scribbled mine down while she was speaking. Um, uh, but I think there is something quite important there around um, uh, the way communities form. So um, if a community is a group of people with some common interests mm. coming together, it's interesting to me how often that common interest is something creative and cultural. So my organisation, Voluntary Arts, represents amateur and voluntary arts groups across the UK, of which there are tens of thousands. And that pattern of people coming together locally because they want to sing or they want to make something or they want to dance and forming a group and then developing their skill is centuries old and, and very common pattern across the world. Um, the thing I just wanted to emphasise is um, remember those definitions and remember that process and remember what communities you're part of I think there's a danger when we start thinking of community in the way that we think of audience, yes. you know, as a group of people to be done to, a group that we have to involve in our program. You're part of a community, you know, the, everybody is part of multiple communities in, in your own lives. I think the bids are stronger if they're building on existing communities, building on existing interests, using the assets that exist within your borough, um, not just the tangible, professional, funded buildings and institutions, but all of those community groups that happen around kitchen tables in community centres, in, in pubs and village halls. Um, there's, there'll be a richness of creativity and culture in each borough to be built on, rather than, there's a, there's a danger that we use government surveys and Arts Council statistics to talk about cold spots in areas where there's very little arts engagement. I tend to think in those cases there's very little arts engagement of the sort that those surveys measure, but there's plenty of creative activity happening um, sort of slightly below the radar, and that's what we need to tap into. Great. Rosie? Well, I'm going to probably shoot myself in the foot a little bit here, but I um, get a bit frightened when we're talking about community and how to use it. And I know I've had this conversation with so many colleagues at Time Out, um, and I was brought into the business to drive community. And from a business standpoint, that can be quite difficult because community is exactly that. I think those definitions are pretty much spot on. It's about people being unified by a place or something specific, and it's super, super powerful. Um, I think the place factor is incredibly important. Um, if I've never seen anything like through Time Out where people love their borough um, mm. in such a way. We do it with the Love London Awards, we do it through our community of tastemakers as well, but very much that element of them being in an area but then having a specialist interest as well where let's say in you live in Bermondsey and you live and breathe for rock climbing or something like that those little niche communities and pocket communities are quite closed they're not always completely open to us as businesses to access and I think what I'm trying to get across here is overall for me community especially from a business perspective needs to be a two-way street 
Um, everything that we do at Time Out, which is to do with our community, rewards them in such a way that they continue to be engaged with us. So I think it's important to think about when you're asking communities to do things, that you're also making sure that they're getting a return on that. And that might be you know, championing your area and, and hoping that, fingers crossed, you win the bid. But there may also be other ways that you can seek to raise awareness. So I think community, for me, yeah, it needs to be, especially from a business perspective, both ways. I think what's interesting about our panel is, is each member inhabits what I would describe as a different world, but the, the, the golden thread is, uh, that has been used, uh, analogy has been used before, is, is that what links them is, is this aspect of people and communities, um, volunteers, uh, placemaking, uh, Barbican and the work that you do outside of that, the press and the social media and stuff that you do and the awards and heritage. Um, Emily, can I um, offer the same question to you, the meaning of community? Yeah, I, mean, I think there, there's so many different scales of community, um, from a network of just immediate streets through to a place, through to a, a borough identity, or even through to sort of you know, London as a, as a community, which of course is something that we've been thinking about a lot lately, is kind of the strength we get from our identity as, as London. Um, and one of the things that we think a lot about at Historic England, of course, is how heritage links with community and place, and the importance of of um, understanding the, the character of a place before thinking how it might change. And I think um, we've got a, a Keep It London campaign we're calling, which is about how to keep distinctive character at the heart of London as it goes through inevitable fast-pacing change. And, and one of the real reasons for that, I think, is because we see that a sense of place is what helps to build community. And London is so extraordinarily diverse, both in its people and also in its places. You know, even in one small-scale geographic community, there's such a range of different types of buildings and landscapes and places. And it's that diversity, I think, that can bring together the different types of people that are living in that small scale area and really finding a strength from the community they get with understanding their place. And I think knitting together a community in a place-based way is a really important way of us feeling strong as both a community and then as, as, as a geographic place as well. Great, thank you. Juan? Yeah, well, uh, to me, uh, every, every time I hear about particip participation or community, it's, it scares me a little bit because we, we are used to hear that as an excuse to invest in huge events or infrastructures, etc., that end up empty or uh, directly in ruins. I don't know if you know about Madrid being Olympic for three times, so we are the first uh, city that has Olympic ruins without being uh, Olympic city. It's amazing, <laughs> it's incredible. So uh, a good um, experience for me about what a community can do is uh, after the 15M, I don't know if you know this movement that was in Spain, it was in between uh, Arabic Spring and the Occupy movement. So after this movement, uh, local citizens decided to, to build up out of nothing uh, local parties. And nowadays, uh, most of the biggest cities of Spain are run by these local parties. It means that Madrid, Barcelona, Coruña, Zaragoza, Valencia, etc. they are all run by these citizens. And it's not that they are run, but for example, in the case of Madrid, they reduce the debt of the city in 2,000 millions. So it means that when you got together and you think locally, you can really change things. So the main challenge now for these cities is how to incorporate these two concepts, uh, community and process, to activate this community to directly being able to manage the city. How can we make decisions as citizens? How can we transform our environment and our surroundings? How can we uh, learn to, to create new ideas as a community? So there are some programs that are being developed in this, uh, in this uh, uh, city councils, and I think that's why more or less uh, you invite me somehow. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. It's, uh, how can we make a participatory process to decide how is going to be spent the budget? So there's a program called Decide Madrid, Decide Madrid. There's 100 uh, millions, and uh, local citizens, individuals, they propose things, and the rest of the people vote. This is all online, and at the end of this uh, process, the city council has to implement the ideas that has been chosen. The second one is how can we create ideas? I mean, one thing is that I propose an idea, but how can I get to this idea? So let's try to do labs in the different districts and to experiment with joining uh, experts and local citizens to propose solutions for local uh, problems. So that's another program. And the third one is how can we build the city with our hands, so thinking with our hands. So 
can, is it possible to gather together all these uh, actors that are consciously or unconsciously are built in the city, firms, uh, universities, uh, local uh, associations, etc., neighbors, and to propose how to recover, how to reactivate abandoned places using art, culture, or architecture as a tool to consolidate uh, the communities that are inhabit these places. So these are some examples of things that a community and a processes can, can do. And I, I wanted to add one question, is that uh, these words to me are quite strong and, and they can be very funny. So there are concepts that are really, really useful. And I was wondering uh, how and why is the London Borough of Culture going to use them? Because I think it's a really good challenge. How and why? How and why is going to use these concepts or are going to be developed through the process of, the, of this uh, program? Very good. Hold that thought, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, before we move on, are there any, uh, does anyone have any thoughts about community, the, the conversations that have just been had? Anyone? Good. I, I, one, I was just thinking earlier about, you know, the, you know, when we think about community, we think about our own uh, vulnerabilities and our own connections. And, you know, and as a child, um, as a family, we used to cross London a lot uh, for various reasons, from South East London to South Hall, once a month to go shopping because the shops and the ingredients and the food and the magazines and that sort of stuff were not available in our part of London. <clears throat> so that was, that was, a, that was a, a journey that we made uh, uh, monthly. And we would stop off uh, at Elephant Castle. My dad would have a pint at the Charlie Chaplin pub. So we engaged with another borough. Uh, we'd fill petrol up somewhere further down in Battersea or in Vauxhall. There'd be a loo break in Kensington and Chelsea. And then we'd, we'd have tandoori chicken in uh, the London Borough of Ealing in, in Southall. And then it would be the reverse all over again. But that, that tended to be just a straight journey back home uh, in the middle of the night. But as, as, as London has uh, developed and as London has grown and as those communities have become stronger and closer, that kind of movement happens less. You know, it happens far less. So as a parent now, I see, you know, uh, the children uh, or the friends of my children who are traveling, who, who have no need to make those epic journeys from one corner of, of London uh, to another. Um, and of course, uh, we'll all have examples of that. Yeah, those of us, whether you're from the city or, or not, there'll always be an example of movement and engagement with places that you're not necessarily spending an awful lot of time in. Um, and also, my other claim to fame is I, I have an auntie or uncle in almost every one of the 32 <laughs> London boroughs uh, of London. You know, there's, there's, there's somebody there who, you know, who, who we've been to. So I've, and, and they've often, you know, and, and I was also thinking, they've often lived in corners of London which are not necessarily the most culturally vibrant, you know, but nevertheless, they, that's, that's the story. Um, the, next, the next question I really wanted to pose is, uh, which is of our time. Uh, really, and that is, why is it important uh, to work with communities, especially at this time? Emily. Um, I think uh, this, this point of resilience is something we've talked a lot about lately, and I think it's always helpful when times are difficult is to have a, a, a long, broad view and to kind of take strength from, from history often and a sort of shared sense of of history, and I think that's really helped us kind of come together as a as a city lately, is by thinking about sort of you know, what we share, um, and it's something we think a lot about in terms of the future of London as well, the community, and in, in terms of what we what we're going to build, um, and we talk a lot about protected views, and one of the things we often go back to is, is St Paul's, the mighty dome of St Paul's that sits in the middle, and um, whether you're of the Christian faith or not, that building has such a resonance for everyone who's lived in London for hundreds and hundreds of years, and, and we, not to completely take this moral high ground, but we do feel like at Historic England that it's so important to protect and to think about protecting those really cherished views that contribute to the, to the history of, of London, because that helps us feel strong as a place, and you think about that building in particular for 
all it's endured. You know, and during the Second World War, it was a great monument of, um, of resilience, and it made us all kind of get through the war um, it, by its very survival. So I think we sort of owe it to, to, to landmarks to look after them. And I think that does help us sort of, we all have a, a view of certain buildings and landscapes um, that make us feel connected to the place, and I think it makes us more resilient. It's also the, sort of the variety of, of heritage around us is that all the places we live are not just major landmarks and monuments, and every neighborhood will have its own history. And I think that by connecting into that, and we were talking a little bit about Carnegie Libraries at the beginning, and um, so many people who have gone to their own local library, which is probably listed and will probably have you know, some kind of heritage value, but it'll also have community value because of all the life-changing experience that have happened in that place. And that will be all sorts of different members of a community will have connected to that building in some way. And I think it's important that we, we share those, those connections with our landscape. And I think that makes us feel stronger as a community when we, when we realize that we have more things in common through the places that we inhabit together. Um, just, to, just to put some context to that, um, next August is the 100th death anniversary of Andrew Carnegie. And his uh, philanthropy, as many of you will know, exists in bricks and mortar. Sorry. <laughs> exist in libraries, uh, a library which I grew up in, many of you I'm sure, and, and others. So it's an interesting moment to mark, I think, in our mm. capital's history. Um, can I ask, uh, Robin, the same question of you? Why is it important mm. to work with communities, especially at this time? Well, we're in a place of politics, and I think it's wrong to ignore the politics of that question. It, there's, um, for me, we've seen over the last two or three years, both here and, and elsewhere around the world, that increasing uh, consequence of communities that don't feel listened to, communities that feel isolated, ignored, um, disconnected from the mainstream, disconnected from power. So you can see a thread through the EU referendum last year where a lot of people were voting as a protest vote uh, against how they felt they'd been treated or how they felt they'd been ignored or, or unlistened to. You can see similar comments in the last few weeks uh, in London about communities not being listened to and, and warnings not being heeded. Um, there's something quite worrying and powerful there about the degree of disillusionment and disconnection with, with authority, with government, local and national. Um, there are, there are good examples and there are bad examples. I'm not saying the world is, is, uh, is completely falling apart, but there's a worrying trend there around um, that lack of involvement and consultation. And, and I think somewhere we've got into more of a habit of doing something we call consultation without really consulting. Uh, how often do you see you know, somebody appear with a clipboard and a set of questions and, and tick the answers and go away? And, and the people being questioned have that sense of nothing has really changed and they're not really being listened to. There's a sort of lip service consultation going on. So I think, I mean, I, I, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think there's something there about my earlier point around um, building on existing assets, building on activity that's already happening in communities, um, around going out and finding more about that, uh, going out and listening to what people want to say, what they're talking about, what they're doing themselves. Um, so I would hope in building a bid for this kind of program, uh, there's a process which you're probably already engaged in but, but could become part of this about digging out what's already happening in the borough, digging out what people's interests and concerns are, rather than coming up with the idea today and going and presenting it and checking people are happy and, and ticking off a number of consultation uh, brownie points. Somebody said earlier today that that sort of difference between holding a town hall meeting and expecting people to come and going out to where they're already meeting, finding their groups, uh, being genuinely inquisitive. I'm going to plug a report which we produced at the end of last year. Um, uh, Voluntary Arts did this series of um, consultations around the country. Uh, our focus particularly was in black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, looking at the sort of amateur and voluntary creative activity that happens there. And we produced this report called Open Conversations. Our, our learning, and, and we, I think we were slightly naive and, and learning as we went about this whole process, but what we stumbled on was this idea that actually if you just go and ask people uh, genuinely inquisitive questions about what they do and, and listen to their passions and listen to their interests, you get a lot more than going in with a preconceived set of questions. So it's not rocket science, but there's something quite simple and welcoming there around finding out what communities are interested in and what their concerns are and what their worries are um, and trying to break down that sense that people feel disconnected, disillusioned, not listened to, and not part of that political debate. 
I mean, time, you know, th there is a challenge that lies in front of us, and that is the time that you have in order to put these bids together and submit them, and, and, and of course, the capacity that, that will obviously be different to different boroughs. And those are challenges, but I think, I think that's really interesting to, you know, listening um, is, is, a, is a really key value, I think, in, in, in this process, um, but, but also being conscious of capacity and time. Um, I wanted to add just one thing, uh, talking about resilience that you were saying, Emily. It's um, ecosystems that are more diverse, they are more capable to resist uh, the stress situation, situation of stress. And at the same time, systems that are more complex are more capable to give uh, solutions to a, a complex situation. So avoiding or keeping disconnected of the city or, um, of the, or how to manage the city. These communities uh, seems like a non-logical situation for, for solving the actual situation that we live in all over the world. So, yeah. I mean, I agree with you about going out. I think that's really, really important. Certainly the work we do with communities. I always try to make sure that any meetings we have are within that community and not asking people into the Barbican, though we want them to come back to the Barbican as well. Mm. But maybe the very premise of the question I would disagree with, because... I mean, it is important now that we work in communities, but I think it always was important and it always will be important. Yeah. And if we're thinking about the London Borough of Culture, you know, and we're talking about legacy, we don't only want to think about this moment. We want to think about the future. Yeah. And there will never be a time when it's not important. And I think perhaps as a publicly funded organisation for us as well, um, you know, we really want to do this work, but there's also a moral duty because we are spending taxpayers' money and uh, you know, everyone pays their taxes, so everyone has a right to access the work that, that we do. I think there's that as well. Louise, on that note, could you talk a little bit about um, your specific example that you wanted to share with us yeah. today from the Barbican's point of view? Okay, so the example I want to talk about was the um, Walthamstow Garden Party. The fourth edition of this will be on the 16th and 17th of July, so you've got a chance to go and see it. <laughs> um, and it's, um, when I say we, it's an event that's produced um, in partnership with um, uh, Waltham Forest Borough Council and also um, with CREATE. Um, and each year it forms slightly different, uh, takes slightly different form, but uh, we have attracted each year about 36,000 people to that event over the weekend. We work with uh, around 70 different uh, local organizations, arts organizations, crafts organizations, businesses. There are at least 400 young people involved in this event and probably 1,000 participants across the weekend as well. But it isn't just an event that's about two days. It's an event that, has, uh, that is about the work that we're doing with those partners year round and that those partners do themselves as well. So there are some um, particular things that we do in terms of regular meetings we have about the event. We have um, community masterclasses. We have community ambassadors. We have work going on in schools. And this event then provides a platform for that, that work to be seen by the local community alongside work that the Barbican brings as well. So it might be quite unusual if it was a pure community event to attract 36,000 people, but what happens here is the community work gets 36,000 people seeing it, and the work that Barbican brings gets a different audience as well, so everybody benefits from it. Um, part of it is, part of the intention eventually is to make the Barbican obsolete and to hand the event completely over to the community. And that's one of the things, I'm just looking at partners here, <laughs> that we're working on and grappling with because it's not an easy thing. But because the event is divided into different segments in, the, in Lloyd Park, in Walthamstow, where it happens, we are gradually each year passing on a different segment to the community so that they manage that segment within the overall event management um, expertise that we provide. So eventually, we will not be needed. That event will be completely owned by the community and we will be able to spend that time, effort, money and go um, to another borough. To, yeah, not necessarily another borough. What do you think, Lorna? <laughs> another borough? <laughs> Maybe another borough. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Laura. Lorna. <laughs> could, could we get a microphone to you? Thank you.
I mean, I should say we do work in other boroughs as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not just this one. Some of them might be up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just in terms of the, we're talking about community, um, I mean, the Barbican are a fantastic partner to work with, but in fact, but, but in terms of reaching a, a community, and, and sometimes being a local authority means that you don't have the same connections or you, you have a different relationship with the community. Sorry, Laurie, so, you're, you're from the local authority. So, yeah, I'm Lorna Lee uh, from Wales Forest Council. Yeah. yeah. Um, so working with the Barbican, the Barbican can enable networks to happen and link with existing networks that sometimes as a local authority it's just a little mm -hmm. bit more difficult to do. So embracing and working with community and local partners, which we have here, um, I think the Barbican helps us, helps us out by doing that on our behalf as well. I mean, it's not been a, an easy journey all the way. I was talking to Laura there before. I mean, the first partner meeting we have, and we have these quite regularly, was all full of worries about the parking, worries about the noise, uh, give us the money, we'll do it ourselves, we don't need you, all of this sort of stuff. I'm sure that some of you will be familiar that, with that. When we had the wash up meeting after the last festival last year, it was all, please don't leave us, please work, carry on working with us. You know, <laughs> this really works, we need the input you're giving. And that for me was, you know, really a wonderful thing to hear that over those three years it had that, the whole, attitude had changed. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, we've got 15 minutes left on this panel, can you believe it? <laughs> you, you probably can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's late, but remember it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would like to ask uh, Rosie um, about your, we were talking earlier at lunchtime, again, as I was saying earlier, the, the panel inhabit very different areas and suddenly, you know, it made me realise how, you know, we have historic buildings, we have uh, the connection with small businesses, we have the outreach, we have the uh, animation of public space and we have the connection with volunteers. You know, suddenly it opens up the possibilities of who we can engage with. So, Rosie, can you tell us a little bit about your Love London and your small businesses sure. uh, campaign? So, I wear two hats at Time Out. Um, I never knew I was going to wear the second hat, which is the Love London section. Um, so, the first side is that I look after community, which is our community of tastemakers. We have them in seven cities across the world. Um, what we realise as a business is that we're actually probably contrary to popular belief, we're quite a small editorial team, which means that we can't get everybody out to review every new restaurant, bar, shop in the whole city. Um, so we needed some help and we thought, well, we've got a huge audience, but we weren't really engaging with them. So one of the things that we did there um, was to ask people to apply to be part of our tastemaker community. Um, they have to have a strong passion for London. They have to uh, write reasonably well. Um, not necessarily to a professional standard, but just to a point where you can read it. Um, and also that they really have a passion for time out and the area in which they live. Um, so we were really astounded when we first launched it in London that, that we had such a good response to it, really. Um, we, it is very much a two-way street. Um, they write reviews on our site, so it's not the editorial reviews that you'd see, but they write user reviews on our site, which means that when somebody comes and looks for something in Stratford and we haven't had a chance to review it yet as editors, then we're able to uh, at least have some content on that page for people to see. So for us as a business, it's been super powerful. Um, but we've gained much, much more from that. And actually, I think one of the things that's really cool is it's helped us to build partnerships with other organisations. So we provide perks and freebies for that tastemaker group. They get to go to the theatre quite often, and we work with organisations, in fact, like the Barbican. They've been down to the Barbican before. Um, and that means that suddenly, all of a sudden, or oh, suddenly, all of a sudden, oh dear, it's getting too late on Friday, isn't it? Um, it just means that we're able to actually have... Um, conversations and relationships with people that we haven't been able to before. So that's one side. And the second side is the Love London Awards. I'll just ask, has anybody heard of Love London Awards before? <laughs> okay, most. Good. <laughs> that must mean I'm doing something right. Um, so the Love London Awards is part, part of the bigger Love City campaign that we run. Um, I'll be honest, it doesn't actually have a real commercial benefit for us as a business, um, which is a bit strange maybe for a publication, but... All in all, it really is something that we wanted to do to help highlight cool, independent businesses in each area of London um, and not just Zone 1. So one of the challenges that we have is that we have got a large audience um, and we don't deny that, but we don't have audiences 
absolutely everywhere in every pocket of London. And we don't actually, we're not an expert in absolutely every part of the city. Um, so when we launched Dove London, it was very much with the charge that we didn't want to be promoting the Starbucks and the Costa. It's just not really sort of our DNA. Um, but what we did want to do is find those little special places. And we don't know. I mean, I don't know about Sydenham. I don't know about High Barnet. I don't necessarily know all of that information, and neither did the rest of the team. So we didn't know how to reach those audiences. We didn't have an email database. We didn't have partners who necessarily had all of that information. And I think this is a parallel that a lot of the people who are working on bids will um, encounter. So what we did is we reached out to all of the local businesses in those areas that we had information for or able ability to contact. Mainly it was via posts, which seems a bit archaic. Um, but the reason for that is that we didn't have any email data and sometimes we didn't have any telephone numbers either. So we sent them a pack, letting them know that the Love London Awards were happening and how they could activate their community to get involved. So of course that was partly how to promote it on social media, but also giving them posters that they can put in the window. And I think local businesses will be an amazingly, amazing opportunity basically for the bid groups um, and the different boroughs to go after because you're not able to just step straight into a community. It just doesn't work like that unless you've already got a connection with them. But those local businesses, have got taps on those communities, 100%. Mm. And um, for us, it worked really, really well. In fact, the first year we did it, we spent probably all of our time and energy, I say about 85% of our energy on the consumer marketing. How can we get people to vote? And what actually worked was the business to business marketing. So talking to the businesses who then passed it along to their consumers. So I think if I take one away one thing, it's just that talking to those people who can reach those groups, whether that's businesses or it could even be associations or small community group managers, um, start there, it would be my advice. Excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, through line of walking into an independent small business, unlocking a community through that route, I think is very clear. I mean, it's, obvious, it's an obvious one, but it's worth worth being reminded about that that particular campaign has, has been successful and thank you for that. Um, any, yes? Sorry. A question just over there. very much. Um, I'm uh, Barbara Eifler and I run an organisation called Making Music. We support lots of leisure time music groups from amateur orchestras to brass bands to drumming groups to choirs, um, not just in London but throughout the UK. So my, I don't know whether it's a question or an appeal or something, um, it's to, to look at the local um, infrastructure in the same way that you obviously it's a great idea if you go and talk to these music uh, community groups but also to see where they're meeting so in the same way that you're suggesting going to talk to local businesses go and find that local community hall that's been neglected for the last 20 years and actually that is where everybody from the scouts to the music group to um, you know, the amateur dramatic or whatever will be meeting and they, they can lead you to the community. And also that infrastructure is so massively important because it is just around the corner because it means your 13 year old can go there safely on their own. So it's, um, it's not too far away. And so that, that's probably a sort of heart of the community that doesn't um, often register. And so please think about those places and, and that they help you uh, reach people and that they are really important in their communities. Great, thank you. I was really inspired by uh, Stella's um, uh, 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 words earlier um, about the transformation of you know building something up and not necessarily winning, but what comes from it. And Shanine mentioned this earlier as well. And I think it relates to what you're saying about mapping. This is an opportunity to map yeah. what you have, you know. You may know it very well, but it's just another opportunity just to kind of turn that page. Um, we have another question here, please. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. wanted to ask the difference between consulting and involving. Where do, you, where do you see a difference? And I think it's sort of speaking a little bit to what Juan was talking about in terms of a kind of a genuine democratic kind of um, uh, 
leadership, cultural leadership of a space, rather than sort of being outside and trying to get in through all these different routes, which are obviously valid. But I'm wondering whether, especially for this bid, is there a difference between consulting and involving, and could we be looking at involving people uh, in, in how we actually shape a programme? If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. maybe that's, Holland, can we, can we have you? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's one of the main goals. Right. We usually do by uh, delegating some responsibility on the people you're working with. Mm -hmm. There's a, one stupid example, but I think it may work. When you're working in public space, you, you, you're having all the time unexpected situations. It can be good or bad or however. And usually when you're talking about participation, they are, it's quite annoying participation because there's always someone who is protesting for whatever. And the main case is when you're, doing to do, you're going to do a concert or a um, public cinema and there's someone blaming because of the noise. So usually you cut the cinema or you have uh, an argument with, uh, with the guy that is blaming. But in, if instead of that, every time you get, you get the number of this guy and every time you're going to do an activity, whatever it is, you call him, is this okay, the volume right now? Is that okay for you? Now, yes, yeah, yeah, now, and now, and now. Then it becomes part of the team. Instead of the problem, it becomes a solution. Because if he agrees with the volume, everyone in the neighborhood is gonna agree. So you will never have a problem. So there are several ways of involving people and it's not just going or consulting or let's do, let's build together. It's maybe you have a superpower, no? And your superpower is that you're here, is really, 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 really <laughs> focused on the noise. So we can use it as a good thing instead of uh, annoying something that forbid or that stop the activities or something like that. Can I just come in on that? Sure. I, um, uh, that's a really interesting example. Uh, we, we run a, an awards scheme called Epic Awards, and we had a, a group enter this year in Blackpool, actually, who were a lo group of local residents who had argued with the council to get some of the money from the arts budget, and they decided how it was spent. But the process was really interesting because the group of residents decided they wanted to spend it on a new set of public sculptures. And so they got, had to go and research this and find an artist and then realize how much this was going to cost and then realize they couldn't afford anything like that. And they, had to, and they went through all those processes of compromising and thinking and being creative and thinking what they could achieve that would be cheaper but would still do what they wanted. And it just transforms their attitude to what if the council had just bought something and put it there, you know, they, they would have you know, probably not liked it very much. But so th that in degree of involvement and decision making can be very powerful. I just wanted to uh, flag somebody else's report. Uh, so some of you have seen last week, King's College London produced this report called Towards Cultural Democracy, which I would recommend to everybody. It's really interesting, and really interesting in this context, actually, around involvement and decision-making. Um, I like the terminology that the report uses, which talks about cultural capabilities and cultural opportunities. So the sense that everybody has cultural capabilities Everybody is capable of being creative and doing things, but not everybody has the opportunity to do so. So I'd like to move away from uh, a sort of traditional sense that we must go and help the people who aren't creative to become creative. No, those people are creative. They just, they need the opportunity, the space to do it locally, that village hall. They need the opportunity or the idea. Um, so there's something quite powerful in here about moving away from that traditional sense of uh, having to improve access. There's nothing wrong with improving access, and the mayor spoke about it this morning, but if access is just taking the people to the art or showing the people the art, we're kind of missing something there about helping them to co-create, co-commission, co-produce, helping people to realise their own creativity. I think it's a really important part of this. Great, thank you. I feel it's like that 8.15 moment on the Today programme, you know, when <laughs> you've got 35 seconds to round up, mm. and I'm just going to try that. I'm going to take one more question from the floor, please. And as the microphone's going over to you, I'll sort of try and summarise. I mean, the, the words of cohesion, value, hope and understanding have been repeated throughout the day. And I think what, what we've seen, what we've heard today are making the invisible visible and this terminology of accessibility, giving access in its widest forms. Um, a very live learning point from Paisley's bid for UK City of Culture. We are, um, we've been careful when we've had our community conversations to talk, to use cultural language like prototyping, rehearsing, yeah. and, and being 
working around ideas with people, especially in places like we've no NPOs in our area. So there's, there's a great hunger and there's latent potential, but when people haven't been invested in culturally for a long time, we've been careful not to overpromise about a specific idea at a specific time, but to encourage people to be generous with us and but think about prototyping and designing because you want your program to be as relevant to the context of your place in 2019, in 2020. So I just offer that as a... Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, panel.